Welcome to our quick introduction to JavaScript. My name is Lawrence. I'm going to be instructor for this course. I come to you with many years of web development experience, and I'm ready to help you learn more about JavaScript. This course is a fast paced course, so I do have a warning for you. I am going to be going through JavaScript in a relatively fast pace in order to cover all of the core fundamentals of JavaScript in less than one hour. And then we're also got project at the end of the course, applying all the skills you've learned in those lessons in order to make a dice rolling game that can run multiple rounds output the winner visually on the page. All of the source code is also included and I do encourage you to try the code out for yourself as you go through the lessons to get more familiar with what you can do with JavaScript and how it works. HTML and CSS are suggested prerequisites to this course as we are going to be focused on JavaScript and only JavaScript, writing JavaScript and doing some amazing things with code. Number of students that have asked me to produce a quick paced JavaScript course that can be used as a refresher for JavaScript, as well as a way to get introduced to coding JavaScript with just the fundamentals and then being able to apply those in a real application. So that's what this course is all about. If you have any questions or comments, I'm always happy to help. Just let me know within the Q&A section. In the next lesson, we're gonna dive right in and start coding JavaScript. So let's get started. Hi, welcome. In this lesson, we're gonna be setting up the development environment. So you are gonna to need to have an editor. The editor that I'm gonna be using in the upcoming lessons is called Brackets. It's available at Brackets.io. And you can use any editor that you want, but I am gonna be using this one. And if you are looking to try out a new editor, or if you haven't used Brackets before, this is a great editor to be using. So again, it's available at Brackets.io. I owe. This is an Adobe product. It's free to download. It's got a lot of really nice features such as the live preview, inline editors, and so on. So this is going to be the place where we're writing the code. And we also need to have somehow to render out the code. And that's going to be through a browser. The browser that I'm going to be using is going to be the Chrome browser. Now you probably already have a browser in your system as you're watching this video within the browser. And if you are using a browser, I would recommend using Chrome because we are gonna make use of the dev tools. So if you wanna have the exact environment that I have in the upcoming lessons, this is the one that I'm gonna be using. Uh, it comes with developer tools. So developer tools help us debug. And especially when writing JavaScript code, this is a great way to interact with the code and see what's happening in the background. So this is available within Chrome and as well as other browsers have their own versions of the developer tools. In order to open it up on a Mac, it's Command Option plus C for a Mac, Control Shift C for Windows, Linux, and Chrome OS S, OS or you can go over to the right hand side and select more tools. And then from there, you've got an option for developer tools. And that what that does is that pops up this little window, opens it up in the console. By default, you should have it docked to the right hand side. And with the three dots, you can dock it to the bottom. I am gonna have it docked to the bottom of the page. And what it does is it allows you to write JavaScript code and I'm just doing a quick hello message. And this doesn't actually interfere with the web page. So it runs independently because the JavaScript is running within the browser. So it gives you a place to debug and write JavaScript and try JavaScript code out without updating any of the web page contents. And it gives you also a way to debug. So in the upcoming lessons, I am going to be using brackets. So I'm going to have it opened on the left-hand side, as well as I'm going to have a browser window on the right-hand side so we can see the code and what it's rendering. So what I want you to do now is to open up your editor or however you're writing the code and create a brand new file. I'm going to create just an index file and set up the regular HTML tags. So first we'll save this as index.html and then we'll set up the basic default HTML tags. So we've got the head, title, and then the body area. And we're going to add JavaScript into the page using a script tag. And this is where all of the JavaScript will go. This can be placed anywhere you want on the page. And when you do run the JavaScript code, it's going to execute the code. So sometimes you're going to find it within the head. Sometimes you're going to find it within the body before it closes. Best practice if you are using and interacting with the web page contents using your JavaScript, it's always best to keep it near the bottom 
before the page closes, but as well you can have it in the head if you're just writing JavaScript code that's running some functionality that's not interacting with your web page. So once you've created the index file, you're going to be ready to move on to the next lesson. And I'll just give you a quick example of how we can view that index file. So we'll just create an H1 so we do have something on the screen. So this is the folder that I'm going to be writing the code in. And I see the index file that I've just created. Now you can go and you can open it with Chrome. And that will open the browser window with the file. If you are using brackets, it does have an option for a live preview. So that's up at the top left, click live preview, and that's going to open up another browser window with a live preview of the page. Generally, I do prefer it this way, especially if I'm using brackets, because any edits or changes that I make is going to automatically be shown here on the right hand side. So that as we're going through the lessons, you can see the immediate rendering of the code within the browser window. I'm also going to open up the developer tools. So going into more tools and developer tools and have the console here at the bottom. And it also provides you messages. So there's no favorite icon there. Um, so if you refresh it, that message will go away. So before you begin the next lesson, make sure that you do have an editor open. And I do suggest that you try the code out for yourself as well as open within your browser, the console window and type in alert hello and see what happens. And as well, take that same alert, place it within the script tags of your HTML file that you just created and refresh the page and also see what happens. And you're going to notice that you both instances, you get this hello pop up window and that's JavaScript. So you're ready to start creating more JavaScript and that's coming up in the next lesson. Welcome back in this lesson, we are going to continue to create our JavaScript. And in the last one, we saw how we can bring JavaScript into our web page contents by using the script tags. And we also create a simple JavaScript alert. So that was that pop up alert. And that shows you that JavaScript is up and running within the browser. So what I want you to do now is to create a separate file. And you can call this one script.js or app.js. We'll just call it app.js. And this is going to be where our script content will go. And instead of writing the JavaScript directly within the page, we're going to be rendering it out and writing it within a JS file and simply linking to the JS file from our HTML. And this is going to make it more flexible. And just like with when you're doing styling, you can share it across multiple pages. And this is going to make it more flexible when we bring the code in. So in order to do that, let's uh, copy the alert and clear out the contents of the script tag. And then we're going to update the source of where we're looking for the JavaScript content for this HTML page. And then going into app.js, you can go ahead and you can paste the alert in there. Do a quick refresh and you're going to see that your alert is firing off as well. So that means that all we've done now is that we've separated out the JavaScript from the HTML. So this is going to make it that we can link to our JS file from any HTML page. I'm also going to minimize the side view there. So we've got more real estate to look at when we're developing the code. We're going to be writing all of the code within the app JS file. And this is best practice when you are creating the JavaScript so that you can separate out the HTML and the code. We're making use quite a bit of the console. There is a way to type directly into the console. And this is for debugging purposes and as well when you're creating variables that if we want to hold certain values and use them within our code, we can reference them with a particular variable. So instead of whenever we want to call back Lawrence, we can simply say player and instead of console log hello, now that we've defined the value of player to be Lawrence, we can save that. And now instead of player, we get the value that player is holding. So you can think of it this as a box of information. And whenever we want to recall that information, then we can return it as player. And this is great if you've got longer variables and const is for variables that aren't going to change. So if we have a set name of the player that we're not expecting to change at any point, then we would use const. 
If we have a variable value that we do expect to change, such as maybe a score, we can set the score to initially be zero, and then we can redefine the value of score within the code. And that allows us to have a dynamic value of score. So we can do score equals 100 and see now the value of score is 100. So this is a holder or a container of whatever value. And this provides us a lot of flexibility when we're coding because we can always update these values. Also why we're using the console because this allows us to return those values back. So if at any point within your coding, you wanna know what the value of score is, you can really easily output it into the console. I'll also make the console a little bit bigger. And this is what's known as a string value. And notice that we did quote around the string value. You can do single quotes or you could do double quotes. And score is a number value. So this one doesn't need to have quotes. There are some reserved names, so you can't call it const and set a value to it. You also can't start it with a number. So if you have a variable name such as one test, you can't do that. You can't use any characters. The only characters that you can use, you can use a dollar sign as well as you can use an underscore for variable names. So those are valid variable names. It is case sensitive. So test, test are gonna be two different variables. And I'll just show you when we output that. So we'll call this one string one and this one string two. They are going to be two different variable names. When you are updating the value, you only need to declare the variable one time. And how you plan to use the variable is going to define what you're going to use to declare the variable. So if you're not planning on the variable changing at any point within the code, then you would define it with const, declare it with const. If you are gonna be updating and creating dynamic values for the variable, then create it, would declare it with let. And with strings, as mentioned, we can use single or double quotes. As well, if you do wanna have quotes within the string, so if you had Lawrence Svekis, and if you by chance were using the single quotes for this one, you can always break out of the quotes with the backslash. And so this will still be valid. And as we can see within the output, it's still outputting it as one string name and it's ignoring the backslash because this is breaking back out of the string. So this means that the string is not ended yet. You do need to have the opening and the closing one in order to indicate this is the entire value that's being associated with the variable name. When you are using variable names, also, camel case is commonly used. So instead of having it all lowercase, if you have two words, then you camel case it because you can't put a space in there. So that's gonna throw an error. And that's another one of the rules for when you are creating variables. You can have numbers within the variable, but you can't have it in the beginning. So if, for instance, we want to have test five, we can do that, that's valid. And the nice thing about using an editor like brackets is see when it goes purple, that means that it's valid. If it goes white, then we see that there's some type of error that's being thrown and it's not understanding that this is being a variable that's being declared. And variables are at the very heart of coding. So go ahead and try this one out for yourself. Output some information into the console using console log as well create some variables, some string variables, as well as number variables, and then use those, output them into the console, update the values of the variables, and output those into the console as well. And you can be ready to move on to the next lesson. We're gonna look deeper at variables, the different data types that are available for JavaScript variables, and as well as a whole bunch of fun coding still to come. In the previous lesson, we saw that there were numbers and string values. When we declare a variable, we could set and assign a value to that variable. And we also saw that we can change the value to, assigned to the variable by updating it and reassigning a value to it. Now with values and variables, 
JavaScript has dynamic types. That means that it can switch between different types. So if we want to have a string value now for score, you can update the type value. And within the console, there's a, a distinct difference between the string and the number type. And you see that this one is blue and this one's black, or it's showing up that way within my browser. It might have different settings, but in general, you're going to be able to see that there is a distinct difference between the way that strings and numbers are output within the console. And that also means that if we're adding and if we're updating to a string value, so if we did a score equals score plus one, and remember score is now equal to 100. So this is like writing score equals 100 plus one. So that's where we've got the 101. So now if we did score equals score plus one, what do you think is going to happen? And if you said that, it's going to add a one to the end of the string and automatically convert it to a string. You're correct. So what it did is it updated the value of score now to be 1001 because it is treating it differently because it's seeing it as a data type of a string. And with a string, you can append to the string with the plus sign. And if you're appending a number to a string, then it's going to turn it back into a uh, string value, whereas if you did one plus, it will add it to the front. So it will add it to the front. You can also update if you have the player's name. So we've got it on const, so we're not able to update const. But if we wanted to have another string value, we could update and append another value to it. So this is the same thing as if we just had the words, test words, and it would simply add the one to the front and to the end of it. And we could also add additional words so we can add more strings. So in the end, score is now equal to this string because we've added some content to the string. So we've appended and dynamically updated whatever value is contained within score. And all we're doing is referencing the variable. And JavaScript does a good job between switching between the different data types. And in order to find out what data type we have, you can use the type of method. And JavaScript comes with a lot of built-in methods that help you with your coding. So type of is one of them that lets you know what type of the data type of the variable at the time. So we get a value of number being displayed. I'm also going to comment out some of these and to comment out, just do some backslashes. So that will mean that the code won't actually run, but it will be still sitting within the code. So just to avoid some of the confusion. So the data type of score is a number and the data type of score at this point, once we've converted it is a string. So that's something to keep in mind when you are working with your values that the data type is important, especially when you're updating and if you're adding to those values, keep in mind the different data types that you're working with. Coming up next, we're going to look at another way to hold multiple values within one variable, and that's going to be with arrays and as well with objects. So that's still to come in the next lesson. So for now, go ahead and try out the type of, check what type your variables are, and see what it outputs within the console. And also make some updates. Use the plus sign to add to both numbers and to strings. There are variables in JavaScript that allow us to hold multiple pieces of data and information. So let's uh, take, for instance, if we had some dice and we wanted to hold all of the numbers that are contained for the dice. So possible that you can roll one, two, three, four, five, six. And these are all number values. So you can have numbers, you can have strings, you can also have different arrays within arrays, you can have objects within arrays and all kinds of mix of the different data types. So essentially they hold multiple pieces of data. Let's output the dice array into the console. So save and you see it outputs all of those numbers and you can see all of the contents. And there's also a value there for length. 
So this is important because this comes with arrays and that allows us to know how many items are contained within each array. Another important thing to note with arrays is that it starts with the index value of zero and the index value is the value that you use in order to reference the value contained within the array. So if you wanted to return back the value of four and we want to output that into the console using the square brackets, we would select the index number in order to output that value. So what do you think the index value to return the value of four is? And what value would we have to put in within the square brackets? If you said three, you're correct that that's gonna return back the value of four because remember it's zero based. So starting at zero, so the first entry is zero and that would return back the value of one. So the index value of zero is one, the index value of five is six. So it's a little confusing now because we're using numbers and the numbers are adding to the confusion, but it's important to understand that starting out with zero is gonna return back the first item within the array. Now there's a lot of information that arrays can contain as well as there's a lot that you can do with arrays. So updating and adding to arrays, and arrays come with array methods, and all of these methods provide some really amazing functionality with arrays. You can concatenate two arrays together, you can find content within the arrays, you can find the index value of the content in the array, you can loop through the arrays. So we're gonna look at this in a little bit more detail as we go through the lessons, but the important ones are that you can add to the array and you can add a method to the beginning of the array or you could remove the last item from the array. So we'll try those. There's more information available at the Mozilla Developer Network and this is a great resource if you haven't checked it out that if you are developing code, this is a great resource because it has a lot of code samples and I do suggest that you check it out and try out some of the code samples that are available. Within this one, they're returning back the length of the contents of the array. And because this is a value that is contained within the array, we can always reference and return back the length contained of the array. If we wanna add to the array, we can use dice, push, and then the value that we wanna push to the end of the array. So now the array will have one more item there in or at the end. So with an index value of six, you can also remove out content. And the reason I'm doing it with the declared variable is that we can output that value as well. So this adds a little bit more to the coding that you can do because it's showing us the value. So there's a returned value when we're adding it to the array and that's whatever value we're adding to the array. So that's what information we can output into the console. As well, if we want it to remove last and we do dice pop let's console log out remove last and we'll also console log the value of dice at this point so save and what's happened is when we do the dice pop it returns back a seven and also we see that we've updated the values of the array and removing out the value the last one that we've added in there there was also the shift so with shift we're removing the first one with unshift, we're adding the first one. And let's take a look at what dice looks like. So what we've essentially done is we've updated the array values. And if at any point you wanna see the contents of the array values, you can output it using the index value of the item that you're trying to reference, the value that you're trying to reference. Now there's also another way to hold multiple values within a variable, and that's using an object and objects are similar to what you see with the array, but they use the curly brackets. And with an object, they're paired values. So you can have something like a user name, and then this can be a string as well. If we want it score, we could have a value of score. And let's output the object into the console. So we see that the object contains various values. So we've got user and score. And also objects can also contain an array. So you just comma separate them out and you don't for javascript objects you don't need to quote around the names if you are using spaces then you do need to quote you can do single or double quote and now this object is going to contain the contents of the dice array as well so you can have objects within objects arrays within objects and all kinds of combinations of the different data types 
And a few other things before we conclude. You'll also notice that I set dice as const, but I've been updating the contents of dice. So we are able to do this even though it's set to const because this is within an object format. And with objects, it's just referencing the data point that's contained within the memory location. So this is being stored in a memory location that can be updated. And that's why with objects and with arrays, we're able to reference the memory location. And that also gives us the ability to make updates to the contents, even though we're setting it as const. And basically the variable is not changing because it's referencing a memory location. And the reason that I refer to as an array as an object is that if you type in, if you do type of, and you look at dice, it's going to return back an object type of my object is also an object. So both of these are a data type object. So try these out for yourself and try out some of the array methods. You can also go over to the Mozilla Developer Network and check out the various other array methods that are available. There's quite a few, and this makes arrays really powerful and really useful when you're coding your JavaScript. If there's one thing that's at the very heart of JavaScript, and that's creating functions. So what functions do is they allow us to run a block of code. So in order to create a function, so this is a function declaration, and there's also function expression. So I'll tell you the difference between the two. So we've got our function and lets us run a block of code and that's the code that's between the curly brackets. So we'll output something into the console for this function. And normally you'd have quite a bit of code there running and this is stuff that you would be reusing throughout your application. And in order to invoke a function, you could add it anywhere within the code. So that means that you could write it a bunch of times and that would run that same piece of code. You can also run it within the console and that will also run that same piece of code. There's also function expressions. And these are similar to what we saw with when we do the variables. So we give it a name and then the sign the function expression on the other side of it. And these operate similar to variables that we would be able to assign values and we'd be able to reassign different values to the variable test to. So this is a function expression and we could invoke it the same way with the curly brackets. And the one important distinction is that if we're running, so we could invoke it, but if we're trying to use function declaration, it actually doesn't matter where in the code we place the test one because we can always invoke the function. So even if the function is created, the function statement is created after we're trying to use it, it's going to still run. And that's not the same for the function expressions because this will throw an error because it's trying to use it before it's initialized. And you'll also find this the same thing when you've got variables before, if you try to use them before you're assigning a value to it, you're going to throw an error. So that's the important distinction. And it's not that one is better than another. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to do with the code and what you're most comfortable with as you're writing the code. With functions, you can also pass in values and you can pick up those values as, as arguments contained within the function. So for instance, if we had a value of num and this value can then be output into the console and it can be used within the function. And it's going to work the same way for the function expressions and the function declarations. So now it's expecting a parameter. So let's give it a parameter of 100. And now we've got quite a bit more flexibility when we're writing the functions because we see that it's updating depending on the value that we're sending in it. And it's running that block of code with those updated values. You can also return back contents of a function. So for instance, if you took and if you created a value for a response taking number and let's multiply it by 25, you can return back the response value. And that means that if we did a console log, since we're returning back a value, we see the returned back value within the console. And you can also assign it to variables as well. So if we had 
test one 100, it's going to run the block of code. So it's outputting into the console and as well, it's returning back that number that we passed in times 25 on the return. Also, one important thing to note with variables and how variables work is these are scope based. So because response is declared within test, that means that I can't use response outside of that block of code. It's not going to know what response means. And I see it throws an error there because it's looking for the variable response and it looks on its own scope. And if it's not within its own scope, then it looks to the parent scope and it looks to that parent scope. But because this is on the global scope, this is on the root, it doesn't have anywhere to go. It doesn't have anywhere to look back. Whereas over here, if you define a variable 100 and if you try to use it within your function, and I do need to comment that one out. We still need to make sure the order is correct as we're trying to use the val variable and containing that within test one before we've declared it. So once we reorder, organize it and we declare the variable first, then we run the function. The function is looking for the variable called val. It's looking within the scope. So within the curly brackets, it doesn't find it. So it goes out to the parent where it finds the value of 100. And that's the value that's being returned back within the console. So with functions, there's quite a bit you can do. And we do use functions regularly as we create JavaScript code. So it is important to practice and understand functions. So before the next lesson, go ahead and create a function. Create a function that multiplies two numbers together, returns a response, and output that response in the console. And you can be ready to move on to the next lesson. There's one data type that we haven't covered yet, and those are Booleans. So let's create a Boolean value and we'll set it to be true. And Booleans can either be true or false. And I'll set one more and equal that to false. So there are two options. So it's like a switch and you can think of it as a switch. So let's uh, refresh. And if you do type of, they've got their own data type, which is called Boolean. So either true or false. And they help us with decision making and running different blocks of code in JavaScript. And these can be initiated with conditions. So we can have a condition to see if true then we run a set of code and we'll write output something into the console that says it was true. Save. And you see that automatically gets run into the console. So if I update true to one of the variables there, it outputs into the console. But if we have boo one, we don't see anything output into the console because boo one is equal to false. So with conditions, we also have an option to do an alternative. So if boo one isn't true, then we can output the alternative. So it was false. And we'll see that gets output into the console. So we can also see that if five is greater than three, we get returned back a Boolean value of true. So that means that if we put in a value of five greater than three, we see the response was it was true. If five is less than three, it was false. And this makes really useful when we're coding because in order to evaluate various statements and then return back a Boolean value of true or false, we can run a block of code depending on the result of the Boolean. There's also one more that it can be else if, if five is greater than three, or if five was equal to three, then we don't output anything. And let's add in the else. So the else doesn't need any type of condition. So this just automatically runs in the output, but it was equal is the other option. So if five equals five, then it's going to be true. It was equal. So the way that it evaluates these statements takes the first one, if this is false, it moves on to the next one. If this is false, then it's going to output the last result. If any one of these is true, then it's going to output and run the block of code between the curly brackets. There's also what's known as a ternary operator. And this essentially puts the condition statement in one 
line of code. So we can assign a value, and if this translates to be true, which true obviously does, then we can output for the message and return back for the message a string value of true and separate it by the colon and return back a string message of false. And let's output message into the console. So save, and it comes back as true. If this contains a Boolean value of false, then it comes back as false. And we can also check to see if five equals five, so that comes back as true. So we can put all types of comparisons within that statement and then return back various results depending on what we're expecting. And then also, if we do this within a function and passing in values within the function and then have a condition within the function, this is gonna make it very flexible. So let's create a function and we'll call it roll dice. So it'll have number one, number two. And then we can have a condition here that's gonna look at and compare if number one is greater than number two. And let's also create a variable. And this is gonna be the response variable. So we're not gonna assign any value to it yet as we're gonna assign that within the conditions. So this is just declaring the variable without assigning a value to it. And response is gonna be number one wins. Whereas else, and we need to do an else if number one is equal to number two, then the response is tie game. And lastly, if none of those are true, then we know the only last value that can be true is number two wins. And then we'll take that value and we're gonna return it, whatever we're outputting as the response. So now let's go into the console, roll dice, Let's pass in a couple values, and we see the response for this is number two wins. Let's try some more values. Number one wins, and if it's a tie, we see that's a tie game. So go ahead and try this one out. Pass in a value into a function and have the block of code within the function run a condition returning back a value according to the numbers and variable values that were passed in to the function. And you can be ready to move on to the next lesson. In the last lesson, we created a dice rolling game and we had to pass in a couple numbers into it and then that's what determined if it was a winner or a loser. Well, that's kind of a boring game because we already know the numbers that we're passing in. And that's why with JavaScript, we have the ability to use math to create some randomness. And if you're creating any type of game, then randomness is the key to the game because this is gonna produce unexpected results. With JavaScript and the math object, there's a lot of built-in properties that you can do with math. So you can do all kinds of different methods. And the one that we're looking at is to create random. There's a bunch of different methods and if you want, you can go over to the Mozilla Developer Network and check out all the different wonderful things that can be done. They have an example here of math random. And the way that it works is it generates a math random. So you select the math object in JavaScript and then using the random method, it's gonna return back a random number. And the reason that we multiply it is that this number is gonna be zero decimal and a whole bunch of digits after that. So if we wanna get it into a whole number, then we need to multiply it. And the reason we use floor is that floor rounds it down. So let me show you in the example. So going into our console, and you can do this in any console, and doing math random, we see it returns back a number. And this number is gonna be different every time because it's just randomly generated. So if we take this number and if we multiply it by 10, now that we've got a whole number, and so it's got two decimal and a whole bunch of digits, three decimal, a whole bunch of digits. So we're getting closer to getting a random number from zero to nine, but we need to still multiply and we need to still floor it. So that's what we do with the math floor. And what math floor will do is it will take a number and bring it down to its closest whole number. So even if this is a nine, it will still be a one. So basically removing all of the excess digits past the decimal place. And that's exactly what we need when we do math random. And it's always gonna be zero, so we need to multiply it 
by the value that we want to have producing the random value. So in this case, it's four. In that case, it's zero. So it's going to produce a random number, always a different random number, anywhere from zero to four. If we want to have a random number from one to five, then we need to add one to it. And so this will always produce a random number that's going to be one to five. And we see we got the one, we got the five, we got the two, so we got a bunch of numbers in between. So that's how we can create random numbers with JavaScript. And this is super useful when we're doing our coding. So that means that we don't necessarily need to pass in numbers and we can simply use that as variables. So let's create a variable and we'll call this a and then using what we just looked at math floor and then wrapping the math random and then multiplying by our largest number so let's say we want 10 and then we're going to take this number take this value and add one to it so it's going to produce a number from 1 to 10 and let's do the same thing for b so now we've got two random numbers for A and for B. Let me clear the console. So I can do A is three, B is six. So we don't know what numbers are being expected. And also with JavaScript, we try to minimize how many times we rewrite the certain piece of code. So let's create a function and we'll just call that random number. It's gonna expect a value. So that will be the max value. And then instead of having that, let's uh, return back the value and we're gonna multiply it by whatever val is. So this is gonna produce a number from one to whatever the value is that we're associating there. So if we wanted a number from one to five, we could do one to five. If we want a number from one to six, we could do one to six, and that would produce those random numbers. So now A has a random number, and that number is set to a variable, so that's why it's not changing. And B has a random number, and that's also set to the variable, so that's not changing. So now what we can do is we can take the value of a and b and we could generate a message using the roll dice function and we're passing in the two numbers and we'll console log out and create a really long string here so concatenating together a and b so that we see within the console what the numbers were that were rolled and let's uh, put a space in that message and then whatever the value of message is that's being returned. So let's see what happens. So we got two versus four, number two wins. That's how we can create randomness and utilize the randomness within our code in order to generate unexpected values. So try that out and also create a function to return the random number. It can be ready to move on to the next lesson. This lesson, we're gonna be looking at loops. We're gonna take what we've learned in the earlier lessons and produce a loop. So what happens if you want to write something over and over again? So maybe in the console, we want to do a count. So we've got a starting value for a count. And uh, let's use let and count is 10. So maybe we want to do a countdown. So we've got a few options for loops that we can use and count down using the values. And the first one that we're going to look at is the while loop. So we're looking at while the value of x is less than count and that means that we need to set a value of x so we'll set it to zero and you also need to have a way out of each loop so the plus plus is just short for x equals x plus one so that's going to increment x by one and we'll output into the console so that we see all of the different iterations of the loop counter is and then whatever the value of x so it's going to dynamically change and see the loop starts at zero. So it starts at the default value of X and it continues all the way through to nine. So that's one way to create a loop. And another way to do a loop is a for loop. So all depending on how you want to use the code and what works best for the particular piece of code that you're writing and the best solution, that's the one that you would select. And personally, I usually use the for loops. And I find that with the four loops, so we'll set a value of x, set it to zero, and loop through while x is less than count. So we have that value of count at 10. Or you could also hard code a value. And the more dynamic you make your code, the more flexible it is as you're developing. So we'll do the same thing where we're going to output the value of x. 
And once again, starting at zero, we get a count all the way to nine. And this is our way out as X is always increasing. And eventually this condition is no longer going to be true. And that means that the loop is going to stop running through. There's also ways to loop through an array. So if, for instance, we want to get all of the values that are contained within the array, so I'm going to comment these out. And in order to comment in JavaScript, you can use the backslashes. And what that does is that still runs the code, but any line that's commented, you see it gets muted out within the editor. And that means that that line of code is no longer going to get executed within the script. So we also have an option to loop through the number of items. And remember with the dice, so if we output dice in the console, that with every array, we have a length. So in order to return back that a length value, we can always reference it by dice length, because this is works like an object. So we can do a dot, and that's going to return back that value. So if we do dice length and set it to count and see what happens. So start at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And that actually corresponds with the index values of the items that are contained within the array. So that means that we can use dice. And do you remember how to put out the value of the item in the array? You just do the square brackets and using the index value. So now we're able to see counter is 2, 3, 4, 5. And then this goes for any of the values that are contained within the array. So remember again as well that they could be numbers, they could be strings, they could be booleans, they could also be objects and arrays within themselves as well. So that's how you can output the contents of an array. And there's also one more quick way to do this. And this one is actually really effective. And this is the one that I actually prefer to use if I'm looping through the values of the array. And that's using for each and then having a function. So we get the element information and looping through each one of the items contained within dice and it outputs it as a value of L. And just to comment that, to clean up the console. So see that now it loops through each one of them. It's not returning back an index value, but you do have an option to return back the index as well as the array. Let's uh, console log the returned response for index. So as it's looping through, it's referencing the item that's contained within the array, as well as the index value. And that means that you could kind of put it together in an abstract way, which isn't necessary because obviously you do already do have the value, but you could do it that way. And what this is going to do is this is going to return back the array items that are associated with it. So not the element, but it would be the dice. So once again, it's returning back the items that are contained within there. And lastly, but not least, you can also output that whole array as a variable. And that means that instead of dice, you could use ARR, and that's going to make this more dynamic. So always outputting those values. And that's an easy way to loop through arrays and get the contents of an array and output it within your console. So whichever one you choose, uh, just choose the best way to loop through and iterate the contents depending on what functionality you need within your code. So try all of these out and you can be ready to move on to the next lesson. We're going to start connecting to the web page content. And this is going to be the fun part of JavaScript because we're going to create the interaction and also have dynamic responses coming back all via JavaScript. Before we conclude, there is another way to comment out a block of code. So that's using the asterisks and the slashes and then commenting back into the code with the asterisks and then the slash. And we can also run through and run through a count or a number of times that we want to output values using the roll of the dice and console logging out the roll of the dice with number one and number two, and then adding into that statement the random values of the dice. So starting at 10 and 10. And that outputs number two wins, number one wins, number two wins, tie game, number one wins, number two wins. And then you can also output the random values as variables so that you can see what number was being drawn. 
So you can have some fun with it, combining some of the content from the previous lessons into the loops and running through it a number of times. I've been saving the best to last. And one of my favorite parts of JavaScript is creating interactions within the page content. So let's go start by creating an element on the page. So we'll just have a blank div and we can output a message there that says hello so that we can see it on the screen. So there it is on the screen. So there's our div. And also let's create a button. And this button will just be a click me button. So it doesn't really do anything in particular right now. You can click it and there's no functionality. And this is where the magic of JavaScript comes in because we're able to select these elements from the page using JavaScript and then run some code around them. So we'll create some type of interaction. And the reason I saved this till last is because each one of these elements on the page, it's actually an object. It's a bunch of different values that are associated with it. And this is why we had to save it till the end. So let's go ahead and make a selection of that object. So creating an area called output and then using the document and query selector. So this is similar to if you've used C cascading style sheets, CSS in selecting elements and then updating and manipulating the properties. And because this one has a class of output, we can indicate the dot in order to select the class and save, and then we'll refresh. And now when we see the value of the output variable, it's actually associated with that particular element. So we've got the value of hello contained in there. We've got the div and the way the brackets works whenever we hover over it in the console, you see it on top also being selected. And that's how we can make a selection of the elements. And this is all using the document object model. And the document is the virtual web page that can be manipulated with JavaScript code. So what happens when your web page loads in the browser, it loads what's known as the DOM, the document object model. And this is a representation of all of the content on the page. So we've got the URL, we've got the document element, which is HTML. And then within the document element, it's got uh, style, it's got inner text there, JavaScript, and it's also got a bunch of children and parents. So you can navigate through the elements of the DOM. We've got the title of the page. And then within there, we've got the body object, the head object, and so on. And we've got all of the images, if there were images in there. So we could list through, and this is just one giant object. This is also available on every web page. So let's pop over to the Mozilla Developer Network and do a quick more tools, developer tools, and clear that. And we'll console directory the document object. And then within here, we've got all of this content. So we can also select the document body as this is the body object of the element. And that means that if we can select it into a variable, we can also update it. So using the text content, we can select all of the text content of the page as text. So that's all of the text content that's within that page. And because we can select text content, we can also assign a value because this is just an object just as anything else. So I can assign a value to it. So now notice I'm still on the URL. I've selected the Mozilla Developer Network website and I've updated the document body text content to say hello. And not to worry, I haven't actually updated their web page. I'm just updating the virtual instance of the web page that's built within the browser. And that's exactly what the doc document is and the document object. And when I refresh, my changes go away. And if I want to make those changes again, I could do document body text content equals hello. And you could do this to any web page. So you're welcome to pause the video, try that out. Just don't do it on the web page that you've got the video open on as it will remove out all of the visual content and you'll have to refresh. So you can go over to your favorite website and type in a message and update the document body of it and text content and update it to whatever message you want to display. So going back into JavaScript, so how do we use the document object? We can use query selector in order to select elements and that allows us to interact with those elements. So if I do a console directory, so instead of console log, we do console directory and that allows us to do the object view of the contents. 
and you can see all of this information is contained here so these are all the event listeners that we can add to the element and we can update the classes so it's got a class of output it's got attributes it's got the inner HTML it's got the outer HTML so within the inner HTML it just says hello outer HTML is the whole elements including the div so if you update that you're gonna remove the div from the page or from the visible area of the page it has children it has next siblings so there's a lot of information and you can literally spend hours days navigating through it and there's the text content value so if we wanted to update the output now that we've got it as an object text content of this particular element let's uh, assign a new value to it and we'll write world so save, and you see that it gets updated on the page whenever the code runs. So we've made that connection to what's happening on the web page. There's also query selector all, and the way query selector all will work is it will select all of the relevant elements. So just use a div, and this is just another div that can be selected and for selection purposes. So const, and we'll just call this divs, and then using the document, query selector and query selector all they're going to select all of the div tags and just like with styling if you want to select the tag you don't have to include the dot you just do the tag name if you're doing a class you do the dot and if you're doing an id you do the hash in front of it so save and refresh and contained within divs is what's known as a node list so very similar to what we saw with the arrays where we've got index values and we have a length. If you have, if you are using query selector all, or if you're using query selector and you're, you're gonna be selecting the first matching element. So if we did query selector div, then we would select that first matching div and the rest of it would be ignored. If we do query selector all, we get an array format. So in order to select the divs themselves, we can then use the divs and using the index value that's associated with the divs, we can select those. And we can also loop through them and do all of the things that we were doing with the arrays. So we can also update the text content to say test and just have some fun with it and just experiment as well with it. So next, let's select the button. So select it in the BTN object. So using the document, and because we only have the one element, we're gonna use query selector and we only have one element that has a button tag. So select that and use that within the JavaScript. So selecting the button. And we also have an option to add event listeners. So event listeners are listening for any interaction within the page and that runs a function automatically. So now whenever that button gets clicked, we can run this block of code and it will say hello. So let's try it and click the button and see hello gets output into the console. There's also what's known as the event object so this contains all of uh, the useful information again within an object format that you can utilize within your code so whenever this gets clicked you got this mouse click event and you've got where it's located on the screen and all of these values you can use within your javascript code so you can see how powerful all of this the dom is and being able to interact with the dom can really change and do so much with what the code is. And the most important one here is the event target because this is the one that initiated the event. So you've got the event target and it's a button, it's got a type, it's a submit button and it's uh, within a form, so no null on the form. It's got a value and if you go down all the way out to here, you've got the inner text, so the click me inner text and you can identify what button it is simply by looking at the event object, the event target. But you do have to pass it into the function. So make sure that the event object is passed into the function. And just as we saw with functions, you can call it whatever you want, whatever makes sense that in order to track it. So you can call it E, you can call it A, you can call it event, and then use that within the JavaScript as any other object. So I know we've gone over quite a bit and there's quite a bit to take in because the DOM is just massive. There's so much you can do with the DOM. So what I want you to do now before the next lesson is to practice and update some 
elements, selecting some elements. You can create even more elements within your HTML, select them with JavaScript, update the text content, also add an event listener and update some of the functionality. And there's even more you can do. So I'll just do it really quickly where once you've got the element selected, you can update the properties of it. So you can update its style properties and there's a ton of options from here. So you can update the background color and set it to red. So really able to update and manipulate the look and feel. So try out all the various options. And if you're using an editor like brackets, you're gonna see in the dropdown when you do the dot, you're gonna see the dropdown of the various options that are available within the object to select those properties and update and manipulate them all using JavaScript. Have fun. This lesson, we are gonna be building out the game project. And yes, you do have all that you need, all of the knowledge from the earlier lessons. We're putting it all together to create a fun interactive game. And this is the game that we're creating. So we've got JavaScript game. So it says hello to whatever the player name is. And you've got an option to roll. So you click the roll button and it rolls the dice a bunch of times. You rolled two, computer rolled five, and then it indicates who won, who lost, and if it was a tie game. So it runs a number of random times, so up to 10 random times, and it runs out all of these outputs. And then at the top, it updates the score. So you've got uh, four wins in nine, roll again. You've got two wins in nine, so that was a pretty bad game. But you see we've got the two wins there. It's not counting the tie games. You can also update it to count the tie games and enhance the game as you please. So in this case, we win with six out of 10 times. So we've got six wins in 10 times. So this is what we're building. You can pause the video and create the structure for this game if you want. And I'm gonna be walking you through step-by-step step how to build this simple game using the JavaScript skills that we've learned in the earlier lessons. So we do have the same element structure within the HTML page that we do for the game. So we've got the H1, the div, as well as the role option. So we're gonna be using those and the first thing we want to do is select them in the JavaScript code and selecting the button so that we can make it interactive using document query selector and selecting the element that has a tag of button. And then we're also having the output area. So this is an area where we can output information for the user. And this is available within the class of output. And once you connect both of those, I always go into the console and I type in the variable name just to make sure that I did connect to the right elements. And in this case, I can see I've already connected to the right elements. You can also update that H to H1 tag if you want to say another message. Uh, but in this case, it already is the same within the game. Uh, so you see it says, does say JavaScript game. So the next part is let's uh, create a variable object that's gonna hold the player information. So we want to have the player's name as well as the number of points the player has. And using an object is an ideal way because this provides us the flexibility to contain all of that useful information, the dynamic information in one spot. So creating a player name and we can call this one points. So starting out at zero points. And once again, we'll just clear that and type in player. To make sure that uh, the object is structured properly. So we can also update that output area. So that's the first thing that we want to do is once we've set the variables and using inner HTML. So that's another way to update the HTML that's contained within the page. We're going to output a message saying text content and using a template literal. So I know we didn't really cover this within the earlier lessons, but this is a, another way to add in values within strings, especially when you've got the outputs. And these are backticks, so they're not single quotes, they're not double quotes, they're backticks. And that allows me to have single double quotes already within the, within the code. So going back to the index, and having all of the quotes there being output. And in order to introduce variables, you do a dollar sign and the curly brackets, and then you introduce the variable name. So in this case, it's player name that we wanna output. So that's gonna output Lawrence there. And also let's make output a little bit bigger. So update the style and there's font size. So we can see the message bigger that's being output. So font size of two, and you can update the style properties or you can set them within a style sheet. It's up to you. 
So player name, and we'll type out a welcome message. So welcome, Lawrence. And if you did this with the quotes, that's fine as well. And the nice thing about HTML is it allows us to have a second line, click the button, and we can have a message to the user and input just regular straight HTML. So next, let's add the button. So add an event listener to the button. And the event listener that we're listening for is a click. And then we're going to run the function. And you can also associate this to a named function as well. So it can be anonymous within the event listener, or it can be another function that you've created that runs whenever it gets clicked. So let's uh, actually, let's create another separate function, run code, and it doesn't have to pass anything in. And unless you're invoking the function, you don't need to have the rounded brackets. And as it's expecting a function within this parameter, it's gonna be able to run the code whenever it gets clicked. So once you add in the functionality, just make sure that it is working. Click the button, it updates, it says click. So we're running the code whenever the button gets clicked. And let's uh, reset the player points value. So the player points value. So we're making this dynamic so that we can run it a multiple times and updating the output in our HTML. And we're gonna just clear that with a blank variable. So whenever it gets clicked, we clear out that value and that's gonna allow us to write some HTML code into that. So let's uh, first identify the number of roles that we wanna take. And this is gonna get a random value and whatever number random is gonna get returned back. And that means that we need to get that function that's gonna get random. And it's gonna take in a parameter of Mac and returning back a response value. So using the math object, math floor, and then wrapping the math random within the math floor. And remember, we have to multiply it by whatever value we want to indicate there. So the max is gonna be the value that's being passed in. So it'll be like math random times 10. And that means that we get a number from zero to nine. So let's add one more to that and return whatever the response value there is. So we run the code and we'll console message the value of roles. So you can see how many roles is gonna take place refresh and i use console quite a bit as i'm developing these because uh just to make sure that each step along the way things are working as expected so now we've got the number of roles output there so we want to do eight roles if we click it it's going to do nine roles click it click it click it so it's always doing a different random number of roles so perfect and exactly what we want to happen so let's create a loop for this and let x equals zero and loop while well, x is less than the number of rolls, and we'll increment x by one. And then within here, we can output within the console, let's uh, create the player roll value, and using that same get random function, we'll roll a value of one to six, and let computer roll, and I missed the C there, so computer roll, and this is also gonna use that same function, random of six, so now it's got the player role, the computer role, and we're gonna connect to a function play game. And it's gonna pass both of those values in. So player role and computer role. So now it's expecting a function that's gonna handle that. So let's create another function. And that was, should be play game instead of player game. And this is just taking in value one and value two. And it's gonna do all of the conditions, comparisons, and return that information back. So let message equal whatever gets returned back from the play game function. And this is also gonna make the play game function more flexible if we wanna use it anywhere else within their code. All we have to do is run the play game and this is gonna to check to see which one is the winner and if it's a tie game and return back a message value for it. So let's uh, declare the response object and then add in the condition to see if val is equal to val2. And if they are, then the response is tie game. Else, if val1 is greater than val2, and then the response is gonna be that player1 win. And then else is gonna be a response of computer win. So always get that response, and then don't forget to return the response object. So that's outputting it 
for the message and we'll console log the message and see how the game is playing so far. So now whenever we click the button, that's going to initiate and trigger all of these rounds of games. So player one wins, tie game, computer wins. And notice we're not outputting the values. So it's hard to tell what the actual values were that were rolled. Uh, so let's add that into the message where we've got the player role. And you can use the template literals as well. So doing a dollar sign and the curly brackets to indicate that this is a variable value that we want to return back and do a verse. And then within here, we'll do the computer role. So save and click. And so now we've got the values. So player four versus two, player one wins. Four versus six, computer wins. Two versus three, computer wins, click. So coming up next, we're gonna wrap this up by updating the scoring. And you're welcome to make an update to the score between the two lessons. And we're gonna be wrapping up this project coming up. Welcome back, how's your game coming along? In this lesson, we're gonna be wrapping up this game project. So we've got the button that we click and we're not outputting anything yet. So we need to output the score just as in the game that we were looking at earlier. So right now we're just opening it as a console message. So let's update this to be a message and we'll just call it output or in order to avoid confusion, call it val and get rid of the curly bracket, the rounded brackets. So it's all contained within one value. And because we have that output object, we can take output and update the text content or the inner HTML. In this case, uh, let's stick with inner HTML. So in case we want to add in some HTML and output that, plus we'll use the back ticks. So rounded brackets, curly brackets, and then add a line break. So we click the button. Now it's going to output all of that onto the page. And notice it's only outputting the last one. So that means that we need to add the plus. So that will add it to the output object. Let's do a refresh. And now we're outputting all of those values. So we've got six versus two, player one wins, computer wins. Lastly, we wanna also update the score. So where we've got the player wins, this is where we can take the player points. And notice when we run the code, we're resetting the player points to zero. So taking the player points, and updating it by one, this is gonna update the number of player points. And also let's select that H1 tag. So in the code, we've got it as an H1 tag. So we can select that as a heading. I'll just call that head area. So taking the document and using query selector, select the H1 tag, the element with the H1 tag, the first one on the page with the H1 tag. And now we can take the head area and we can update a score to it, or we can pass the score into a function. And usually that's the best way to go in order to pass it into a function. So let's create a function on update score, and we'll just pass in the score values. And we don't actually need to pass in the score values because we're updating the global value. The only one that we have to pass in is the number of roles and games played or rounds played. So maybe this is just rounds played. So we need to pass in the roles as rounds played. And that gives us all the information we need in order to take head area and update the text content of the head area and set that to equal to, and we use the back ticks once again, and taking the player points value. I just wanna go back to here just to make sure that we're doing it the same way. So we've got update score, you scored, so say your or player points, one in, and then the number of games. And this is just passed in the rounds player variable. And that's it. We don't need to return anything on this function. So whenever we want to update the score, we can do that. And we need to, we should do that after all of the loops are run. So otherwise it's going to be updating it each time. So unless we want to run the function each time. So once you've got your code looking the way that you want and expecting, it's time to debug your application. And that's running through the application and checking to see if there are some errors. And there are some errors actually in this app. So let's check those out. And we see that we did get an error there, that it's get it throwing an error for the role because I did call it roles. So just make sure that we are calling it proper. So refresh once again and we get player points undefined. And that's because I named it wrong as well. So make sure that you update these. So player points. 
So player points 0, 1, in 1, and we should actually add to this in 1 round. And oftentimes you do need to make some tweaks and adjustments and debug your application just to ensure and play through it to make sure that it is working as you're expecting. Uh, so in this case, we see the computer won a bunch of times. So we player only won one time in nine rounds. And we've got all of the results there being output at the bottom. And if you do have any questions or comments, I am available within the Q&A section as well. All of the source code has been included. And I do encourage you to try it out for yourself. Get familiar with all of the functionality that we've been introduced in the previous lessons and then put it into play within this game. And also try making some adjustments and tweaks to the game to make it even better. Thanks again for taking the course. Have fun coding JavaScript.